Dr. Laura Gay, who is the Vice President of Research for the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for inviting me. So prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV is widely considered as one of the low-hanging fruit in the battle against HIV, yet there are still more than 400,000 babies born every year around the world with HIV. So what are the stumbling blocks right now for scale-up of these services? I think you're correct in that this prevention method has been known to be effective for many years and we've uh, succeeded in rolling out prevention of mother-child transmission programs across the world, but the pace at which we've done it has been quite slow and there have been challenges in terms of mobilizing the resources and making it a priority with all the activities that are going on to focus on the elimination of pediatric HIV as a priority both for agencies and for countries. However, this year particularly, uh, this has been a renewed effort and force to say that we know that we can do this, that we have the methods of doing it, and we need to make this a priority f uh, across the world. And when you say resources, do you mean specifically money, or is it more complicated than just money? It's a combination of uh, factors, just like anything, that resources clearly are an important component, but you have to have the political will to prioritize this within country programs, within ministries and governments, the infrastructure to be able to deliver the services and address issues around health care strengthening and workforce uh, as well as commodities. So there's many factors that are involved in putting together a program that's feasible and sustainable and really reaches the most distal levels. That the challenges are really making sure that even in the most rural place that a pregnant woman would have access to these services. So mobilizing all of that and getting that out to these places has been a challenge and one that, that we're ready to face. So you say that we're ready to face that now and I'm assuming one one of the reasons why is because this has been a, an issue talked about here at the conference that this is this is doable. UN AIDS, Global Fund, a number of organizations including your own have really coalesced behind this idea. So why is this different now, this new coming together on PMTCT? I think particularly for us as an organization this has always been a priority and a focus and, and uh, the desire to make this happen. But with all of the other activities going on with um, other prevention methods, looking at rolling out uh, ART that there's been so many areas to focus on at once that it's lost some of the priority and the momentum that was started earlier. So the programs that have been involved have really been looking for the leadership and the uh, momentum to, to garnish the resources and make it happen. Going through looking at the, the data and the numbers in the world we realize that we really can do more if we put the resources together to do that and so this coming together has been really critical. One by one people have gotten on board that this is an important way to go but now we have uh, the resources together with everybody with the same message and therefore um, hopefully stimulating our ability to, to do this in the next couple of years much faster than we did in the original few years. Now your foundation is one of the largest providers of PMTCT and looking ahead for the GHI, President Obama's Global Health Initiative, with this movement towards more integration of care, what does this mean for you on the ground with your focal point being PMTCT, but obviously the patients that you deal with have other issues as well. How will this movement towards integration of care affect you? Uh, you're correct. We have uh, provided services to over 10 million women uh, in, with, uh, through the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, and we're present in over five thousand sites. So with this new momentum we hope to be able to contribute and expand our, our services and our reach to more women. And one thing I want to make clear to people is that PMTCT is oftentimes seen as a separate vertical program but the the premise of what we're looking at with PMTCT is similar to the uh, maternal child health and decreasing maternal and infant mortality. Our focus is getting women, all women, into antenatal care for their uh, scheduled visits to facilitate uh, facility-based delivery and assisted care and to make make sure that babies are followed through the 18 months of their life, uh, looking at nutrition and other factors. So while their programs are a more global focus now on making sure that programs are integrated, this is something that will be easily added upon the, the, the existing programs and the existing platform because I think we're doing a lot of that uh, already. The, the new uh, WHO guidelines for the prevention of mother-to-child transmission are quite broad now, starting very early in pregnancy and following all the way up to the, the baby's uh, 18 months or two years years old. So that platform uh, gives us the ability to promote the same services uh, that decrease infant and maternal
maternal, maternal, uh, maternal mortality, such as uh, safe delivery, as uh, prevention of neonatal sepsis, immunizations for babies, nutrition and uh, monitoring and growth and, and uh, infant feeding support. So all of these are part of the comprehensive package that address MCH issues as well as PMTCT. And can you talk about any new elements in these WHO guidelines that you helped develop, correct? Yes, I was uh, one of the members of the guideline committee. I think that the comprehensiveness of this approach in, for the new guidelines is really what's new. It takes a period that used to be focused around the time of labor and delivery in the first few weeks of life and really extends it earlier in pregnancy for the women who are HIV infected and much later in the course for, for babies. The biggest change in the guidelines is really addressing the issue of HIV transmission through breastfeeding. We know that that's a particular challenge in uh, many settings in the developing world with limited resources in the that not uh, feeding, uh, providing not br uh, breast milk has been a challenge in terms of increased mortality and morbidity. So the new interventions of either providing antiretroviral drugs to the, to the mother or to the baby for the duration of breastfeeding actually allows women to brace, breastfeed more safely and to decrease the risk of transmission. So we're contributing to better uh, maternal child health services by promoting uh, safe infant feeding. The other thing that is not new in the guidelines but is really emphasized that we really have to do if we really want to make a difference in uh, decreasing the number of infected babies is making sure that all women who have low CD4 count and require uh, antiretroviral therapy for their own care um, have access to those services. Not only will that be the best thing for the mother's health and prolonging the mother's life, but also that the women, they are the women who have the highest rate of transmission. So if we can achieve that part of the guidelines, we'll make significant progress both in maternal mortality as well as preventing infant infection. Dr. Laura Gay with the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, thanks for your time.